title of the message this morning is The Mirage and the Reality. The Mirage and the Reality. You know, I've never actually experienced the mirage before, uh, but I can imagine that they are very disheartening. Um, I think by definition, a mirage is an optical illusion of sorts. I think probably every one of us at one point of another have watched a movie where somebody was experiencing a mirage, right? You know, it's the movie where the plane crashed in the middle of the desert. There's no hope in sight. And he's just, going, uh, you know, like crawling across the desert. His lips are so dry. I mean, it's just, it's just a terrible, terrible scene. Your heart begins to, you know, worry for the guy that he's not going to make it. Then all of a sudden he sees this great, incredible body of water. And all of a sudden, it gives him a renewed hope that he's going to survive after all. He just has to, like, work his way over to it. And apparently, it's just not really there, right? It's a mirage. It's, it's something that looks to be real, but is not really real. In fact, um, out of nowhere, they see this. And out of, out, of, out of nowhere, they get this renewed burst, burst of energy. And, and as fast as it's there, it's gone. And, uh, and then they've wasted even more energy trying to get what was not real. And um, what they thought would bring them relief and satisfaction did not. One of the saddest realities of an illusion is that it gives us a false sense of hope. Did you hear that? One of the saddest realities of an illusion is that it gives us a, gives us a false sense of hope. You see, the illusion is not real, but it appears to be very real. I think, practically speaking, we've all experienced situations in our lives where we've been discouraged, where we've struggled, where we've kind of like not been able to see the light at the end of the tunnel, so to speak. As a believer, you question why God allows the suffering, why he allows the discouragement, why he allows the the. The, the disappointment and struggle. And in your mind, you're doing everything that you should be doing as a child of God, right? Anybody else ever felt this way before? You're doing what you think is right. You're doing what you think you should be doing. You're reading your Bible. You're praying. You're, you're walking with God to the best of your ability. And yet the struggle is still there. The disappointment is still there. And you don't seem to see the light at the end of the tunnel where things are going to change. I don't know about you, but I felt that many times over my life. Times where I just think, God, okay, hello, I'm right here. And I've even said at times, you know, it's like, I know God's in control. I know he knows what he's going to do, but I wish he'd let me in on it, right? I mean, I just want to know what he's thinking so I can kind of, you know, kind of navigate what's going on. Meanwhile, it would seem that other people that are around us who are not Christians who are not living for God have it all together, right? It's like they have it, everything as it should be. The picture perfect world. I mean, just watch three quarters of the sitcoms on TV. I mean, right? They have it, they have it all. They have the nice cars, they have the nice houses. Something breaks, it breaks, it gets fixed. I mean, everyone just, I mean, their favorite, uh, you know, repairman for whatever it is that, whatever it is that breaks down in your house is just on speed down. He's right over, right over there. There's no waiting. It's like the picture perfect world on almost every sitcom. Except for it's not. It's fake. It's not real. It's not reality. But we see in the middle of all these struggles and everything that we're going through, we feel like we're doing everything right, that we have it, we have it, you know, everything that we're supposed to be doing, but everyone else around us who's not living for God, they, they get everything. I feel that way sometimes. I'm like, when's it my turn, right? Come on, who else has felt that way? When's it my turn? Right. Well, it's kind of amazing. One of my favorite psalms in all the Bible is Psalm 37. So if you would this morning, take your Bibles and turn to Psalm chapter 37. And uh, as I was reading through this this week, it just impressed on me that God says, hey, let's go through this. So this morning, we're going to look at the first four verses of Psalm chapter 37. And eventually, we'll get to some of my favorite verses at the end of the chapter. But this morning, we're going to look at Psalm 37, verses 1 through 4. So if you would, follow along as I read these verses says, do not fret because of evildoers, nor be envious of the workers of iniquity. For they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. Delight yourself also in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. 
Lord, I pray that you'd help us to do exactly what this psalm encourages us to do this day and from this day forward. And give us wisdom, Lord, as we walk through this passage, Lord. I pray that you would speak to our hearts. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, as I was studying for this message, I came across an old faithful commentary on this passage from Matthew Henry. And uh, this is the Henry. This is the, the commentary that I first started reading from when God called me to preach in eighth grade. I can remember sitting in my room at 10, 30, 11 o'clock at night reading through the big Matthew Henry commentary. You say, that's not normal, right? But I'm not normal. But I like Matthew Henry. But here's what he had to say. So this psalm is a sermon and an excellent, useful sermon. It is calculated not as most of the psalms for our devotion, but for our conversation. I thought that was really interesting, his comments on that. That the psalm is not so much for a devotion to us, as much as it is a, as a conversation to go through. And it's, wah, 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 wah. you know, he's just, I mean, he's just, he, it's just like life is going down in a spiral. That's why he says, and I like what he says there, it's not necessarily a sermon, because we know the answer, right? We could all preach to the choir on this, right? We know what we should be doing. We know what our attitude should be. But the reality is life is happening, and it's like it's discouraging. It's frustrating. And it's a conversation to be had about life. It says there is something in it of prayer or praise. There, there's nothing in it of prayer or praise, but it all is, is instruction. It's a teaching psalm. And it's a reminder to all of us of how we should be living in this day and age that we live in. It's an exposition of some of the hardest chapters of the book of Providence, or the advancement of the wicked and the disgrace of the righteous, he says. But I like what he says. He says, now the law of Moses had promised temporal blessings to the obedient and denounced temporal miseries against the disobedient. Now, that's what the law said, that if you just walk with God, God is going to be faithful. If you just surrender everything to God and walk in obedience, God is going to take care of you, and he's going to bless you, and he's going to provide for you, and he's going to protect you. And this is what the law said, but apparently this is not what they were feeling. And that's where we got to guard ourselves, because so often people around us, they argue emotional person, or many instances occurred of sinners in prosperity and saints in adversity. He said to reconcile those instances with the word that God had spoken in the scope of the prophet in the psalm, in which he forbids us to fret the, at the prosperity of the wicked in their wicked ways. So I love what he says here. So basically, Matthew Henry has said four things that I think are great reminders. I'm just going to mention them and then move on. But first of all, Matthew Henry refers to this psalm not as a devotion, but a conversation. The conversation of a life. As you're going through it, it's just a reminder that we need to go to God, not other people. It's a reminder that we need to find our faith and our hope and our focus in him, not on things. Number two, Matthew Henry referred to the psalm as an instruction. We need the reminder. Just like we would teach our children, God is trying to teach us what our response ought to be to the circumstances. And if we could put it this way, the conversations of life. Number three, Matthew Henry said that the psalm was a hard chapter. I'll say it's hard. Because there's a lot of stuff I don't understand that I really want to understand. I know he knows, but I wish he'd let me in on it. And I just want to know what he's thinking because I just got to let him know even that I'm not understanding what he's doing. And I don't agree with what he's doing, but guess what? You don't have to agree with it. He's God. He's sovereign. He can do whatever he wants. And then number four, Matthew Henry reminds us that the psalmist exhorted not to fret at the prosperity of the wicked in their wicked ways. We're not to worry about it. So let's break down seven thoughts to absorb from verses 1 through 4. As you see, seven thoughts. Number one, we read this right away in Psalm 37, verse 1. Do not fret because of evildoers, nor be envious of the workers of iniquity. First thing is, do not fret over uh, evildoers. Literally, the idea behind not fretting is, do not get heated up or don't get all worked up over it. <sighs> Anybody else struggle with that sometimes? I mean, seriously, you see what's going on and you get irritated with it. They're wicked. They're evil ways. And he says, you're not to get worked up over it. It literally means in the Hebrew, not to get all heated up, to not get all worked up over what you see. Question. Can we have a legitimate expectation of an unsaved world expecting or acting anything different than an unsaved world? 
Yes or no? No. They're acting like they would act as unbelievers in, you know, not knowing Christ. So seeing what other people do, how they act, and how they respond to the situations going on in this world is completely normal. The restlessness of the wicked, or what, however it may frame that, but it has the idea of what it means to be wicked. It says, truly God is good to Israel, to such as are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled. My steps had nearly slipped. For I was envious of the boastful when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Here's a man who's just being honest. Here's a psalmist saying, this is how I feel. It's like almost I was so focused on what was taking place from the, in the hearts of the wicked and the boastful and those who seemingly had it all that my fit, feet were beginning to slip on what I knew was right. That my feet was almost like deal with this and deal with that and deal with this because everyone's wanting a piece of my life. What you don't see is often what's breaking them behind closed doors. But the psalmist is how we feel sometimes. Their eyes bulge with abundance. They have more than the heart could wish. They scoff and speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak lawfully. They set their mouth against the heavens, and their tongue walks through the earth. Therefore, as people return here, and waters of a full cup are drained by them. And they say, how does God know? And is there knowledge in the Most High? Behold, these are the ungodly who are always at ease. They increase in riches. Surely I have cleansed my heart in vain and washed my hands in innocence. So he has the idea here. He was like, I, I have given up everything for what? I've sacrificed for what reason? They have it all and I don't have anything. Why have I done this? You ever felt that way? I have. I'll be honest. I thought, you know, I can remember the... It was our first, second, third year of our marriage. And I don't know what it was. It was the third year of our marriage. We were living in Pennsylvania. And just let me tell you, we were breaking it in, man. Eight grand a year teaching at a Christian school. We had it all not. It was hard. And I remember just before the third year of teaching in the Christian school, the principal came to me and says, you're not coming back, are you? And I said, no. He goes, I figured. He knew God called me to preach. I had so wanted to just preach, and, and he knew I wasn't, wasn't happy sitting in the classroom. He goes, so is it okay if I give your spot to someone else? I said, yeah, go for it. So I gave up my position. Someone else was hired. And then all of a sudden, two months before school was out, two factories in Lewistown, Pennsylvania, shut, got, got shut down. They just closed their doors. 6,000 people without a job. I am telling you, by the time that last two months of school and school got out, there wasn't a job flipping burgers in Lewistown or 20 miles around it. You know what that meant for me? I couldn't find nothing. Because in my plans, Ken Todd's plans, we we're going to finish up the school year, God was going to open up a door for a ministry, and we we're going to step right into it and not have any break from this ministry to this ministry. God had other plans. Three or four months into the struggle, I'm sitting there working jobs that I would never choose, never pick, because i got to provide for my family. And I'm sitting there going at the end, Lord, this is what I went to Bible college for? This is what I sacrificed for, to not have food for my family? And by the way, that was the period of my life where I probably gained the most weight, not having food, but I sure ate, looked like I had food. God was taking care of us, but in my mind and in my attitude, it's like, this is why I gave up a real life. This is why I don't have a sales job, or this is why I don't have a construction job, and this is why, to, for what? To sit here and wondering where my next paycheck is going to come from? This ain't fair. How can this be fair? See, I was worrying about how life was supposed to be treating me, how I was supposed to be getting my piece of the pie. How am I supposed to be living the American dream? And God is like, whoa, hello, I'm still up here. And I had to get to that place in the midst of the struggle where it seemed like there was no light at the end of the tunnel. And I had to say, Lord, okay, I know what you've called me to. I know what's real. And I know that your hand is on us. Okay, God, and if you want me to stay here, 
and do these stupid jobs, I'll do them to the best of my ability. I'm telling you, God worked. And it wasn't until I resurrendered everything that God started opening doors. It was all about what his plans were and not what my plans were. I mean, God taught me so many things, both spiritually and physically, during that next couple months. It was obvious God's hands were at work in my life. I just couldn't see it because I was too focused on the issues rather than the person who allowed them. We worry about what everyone else has rather than what God is trying to do in our own lives. And I think this is exactly what he says in verse 13. Surely I have cleansed my heart in vain, washed my hands in innocence. There's nothing innocent about it. It was not in vain. But my focus was wrong. And then he says, verse 14, For all day long I have been plagued and chastened every morning. Why? Because all I could see was that everybody else was having the good life. Everyone else was being benefited by their actions and reactions. And, um, and poor me, I, I, I'm just struggling so much. So much. I have found in those moments in my life, it's God trying to get my attention. And I can either focus on what everyone else has, or be thankful, be thankful for what God is doing, what God has given me. Number one, do not fret because of, because of you widowers. Number two, do not be envious of the workers of iniquity. Right away in our passage here in Psalm 37, Verse 1, the second part of that verse. Nor be envious of the workers of iniquity. Don't desire what they have. Don't be jealous of what they have. Uh, if you have your Bibles, turn over to Proverbs chapter 3 just for a moment. Next book over, Psalms, Proverbs chapter 3. And look at verse 31. It says, do not envy the oppressor and choose none of his ways. What we don't often know and what we see in the lives of others is how they got there. So don't choose their ways. Why? Because you should be worried about your own way. Is my own life committed to the Lord? Is my, are my own steps committed to the Lord? Don't worry about them. Worry about you. It's easy to look at what people living in sinfulness have and then want those things for ourselves, is it not? It's easy to say, well, they have it all. I want that. He says, don't be jealous of what they have. In fact, in James chapter 4, in verse 2, he says this. You lust and do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. And you ask and do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures. He says, what's the motive behind what you're asking for? Why is it that you want what they have? Why is it that you covet what everyone else has? Why? He says, check your motives. Envy leads to even more sinfulness. Not being satisfied with what we have leads to more sinfulness. In Psalm chapter 90, verses 5 and 6, God's word reminds us that as fast as we can get something, it can be gone. It can be gone in a heartbeat. So why do we really want it? Number three. He says, trust in the Lord. In fact, in Romans chapter 1, this is a familiar verse, kind of on the same line here. Romans chapter 1, and verse 17. It says, for in, in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by what? Faith. Are we living by faith or are we walking by sight? Second Corinthians remind us we're not to walk by sight. We're to live by faith. Over and over, God's word makes it clear. We are to live by faith. And living by faith doesn't always mean that we're going to have what we want when we want it. Why? Because God's in control. In fact, Paul over and over reminds us, and we've looked at these passages before, he said, having food and raiment, let us therefore what? Be content. But man, is that not hard sometimes? Is that not hard? Is anyone else struggle with this? I guess I'm alone on this. It's hard sometimes. I mean, what's, what's wrong with wanting a little bit of this and a little bit of that and a whole bunch of that and not so much of that? What's wrong with that? 
What's wrong with it is this. He says, having food and raiment, be content. Everything else is just extra. Everything else is just added blessing. But that is so hard sometimes. So we're to trust in the Lord. And Hebrews 11, 6 says, but without faith, it is impossible to please God. So, question. How's the faith coming along in your life? Not faith in believing that Jesus Christ can be my Savior. I'm talking about daily faith, to live by faith every day, to put him first and to trust him for the needs of that day. Because it says, they that come to God must not only believe that he exists, but that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So he reminds us that you have to have faith in our daily living. And it's a reminder that the just live by faith. They don't walk by sight, they live by faith. Number four. Getting back to our text here in Psalm 37, verse 3, says, Trust in the Lord and do good. So, number four, do good. You realize that this is one of the very reasons that God created you, is to do good. So often we can get caught up in our own little world, worrying about everything that's going on in our world, that we forget that God created us to do good. In Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, and then I'll say verse 10 along with it, but chapter 2, verses 8 and 9 it says this, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. So he starts the whole very fact that salvation is a gift. It's something that God has given to mankind. And then he says, verse 10, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for what? Good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should what? Walk in them. You were created to do good works. So the psalmist is reminding us of what God created us for, is to do good. Question. What good are we doing for the Lord? Well, say, Pastor, it's not about what I do for God. Yeah, it kind of is, because he said you are created for good works. So if someone were to put a gun to your head, and say, prove to me that you're a child of God. Prove to me that you truly follow Christ. By your life, by your reputation, by your actions, what would give evidence that you're truly doing the works of a child of God? Now, he makes it very clear here. Our works don't save us, right? We know that. We understand that. He says, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. But James chapter 2 tells us that if you truly know me, you'll serve me. So if I truly know Jesus Christ, I will have a work for the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not just about knowing what's right and wrong. God's word says the devils believe and tremble. And other of his disciples said, well, or other disciples that claim to be disciples of Christ said, well, Lord, have we not done these mighty works in your name? Have we not cast out devils in your name? And he said, depart from me, for I never knew you. So it's not just about doing things or knowing things. It's a relationship that results in a life of service. So he says, do good. And here's another thing about doing good. When we're doing good to others, our focus is not on ourselves. Isn't that awesome? Pretty novel concept, right? If my mind is on helping this person and that person and this person, my mind's not on what I don't have or what I can't do or what, whatever it is that's bothering me. Do good. That's the question. Who are you doing good for? The Lord? Do you see someone that has a need? Are you wanting to help with it? When your neighbor needs some help, are you willing to go over and lend a hand? Are you being a picture of Jesus to someone who needs to see a picture of Jesus in the world that we live in? Doing good towards others takes a mind up ourselves. So, as he said, this is not just a quaint little devotional. This is a conversation for life. It's instruction for to do good. Number five. He says in our text in Psalm 37... Dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. So the idea of dwelling in the land, it has the idea of not running from God. It means don't look for something that's greener on the other side. You know, 
I have a lot of pastor friends that are kind of climbing the pastoral church ladder. I'll stay here until something better comes along. I'll stay at this church until God gives me a little bit better salary at the next one. I'll stay here at this level until I get a little bit larger church down the road. I get a little bit more experience, a little bit more you know, abilities in speaking and so forth. And I get there and I think to myself, the grass is not greener on the other side. I've yet to meet a pastor who's left the church because everything was just great. I mean, things are just so awesome here, I think I'll just leave. It doesn't work that way, right? We all know that. The grass is not always greener, and if it's too good to be true, it often is, right? So he said, stay where God has you. Be fruitful and multiply where God has you. Always looking for something better, something more, something grander, something that we think will make us feel better, something that we think will make us happy, something that we think will fulfill us. The mirage. And we do everything we can just to get there. We use up all of our energy trying to get to the water and only to find out that there's nothing there. Nothing that was going to satisfy. Nothing that would bring relief. But we used up our energy trying to get it. Energy that you could have been using for the Lord in service to Him. So He says, do good. Dwell in the land. Don't run from it. How often do we fight our own flesh to run away from what we think might be better? And we mentally beat ourselves up. What if I would have done this? Shoulda, coulda, woulda. Shoulda done this ten years ago. If I would have done this seven years ago. If I would have only done this yesterday, it would have changed everything. Maybe it would have. We learn from it. And we move forward. Paul says this way, not looking to the things that are behind me, but reaching forward to the things, what? For the prize of the calling of Christ Jesus. The reality is we can't live in the past. The past will beat you up. And it will beat you down harder than any person that's ten times your size. Our emotions can kill us sometimes and encumber us. Matthew 6.33 is a good reminder. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Then all these things shall be added unto you. So dwell in the land. Don't run from it. Find your provision and your protection in Jesus Christ. Number six. He says, and feed on his faithfulness. This has the idea of knowing God will take care you really believe that? Do you really believe that God is willing to take care of you? It literally has the idea of feeding on his truth. And what is truth? The fact is that he'll, he's going to take care of us. Feeding on his truth. His faithfulness. I don't know about you, but I can know in my own life that God has been far more faithful to me than I've ever been to him. Amen? He's been far more faithful than I could ever imagine. There's been times where I've been made, where I've made it all about me. God, why didn't you? Why? How come, God, you allowed this? Or, God, why can't I do and fill in the blank? We've all done it. And he's been more faithful than we can imagine. And then the last thing, number seven in verse, in verse four. Delight yourself in the Lord. Just stop and let that sink in just for a moment. Delight yourself in the Lord. Just just let that sink in for a moment. Let that marinate. Who do you delight in? What do you delight in? What gives you pleasure? What gives you satisfaction? What fulfills you? Is it the things of God or is it the things of the world? Because there's a big difference between the two. He says, delight yourself also in the Lord. Why? And he said, he shall give you the desires of your heart. Here's what I found out in my life. 
Here's what I've come to know and understand. And I wish I could say I practice this all the time, but I struggle with it, maybe like some of you do. But here's what I found, that when I delight in what God delights in, let me say that again, when I delight in what God delights in, my needs are met and my desires are met. Why? Because I'm surrendering everything that I am and everything that I want and everything that I hope for through the funnel of what God wants me to have. And the closer I draw to him, the more he shows me of what pleases him. Let's go back to the relationship issue. We've shared this many times. But now that I've been married for 26 and a half years, 26 years, the reality is I've learned some things that please my wife. And I've learned some things that can royally tick her off, right? Let's be honest. We, 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 we learned those buttons. But I've learned what pleases her. And here's the deal. When I want to please her, I know I should do this, 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 or this. Not, do I have to? No, I have a choice every day. But I want to because it pleases her. I want to do these things. It's the same with God. When we learn to submit ourselves to him and become fully committed to him and obedient to him, we begin to want for ourselves the things that he wants for us, right? And when we begin to want the things that he wants for us, that's this verse coming to life. He'll give you the desires of your heart because my desire is what he desires for me. Does that make sense? It's not God's over here and I'm way out here in right field. When I surrender myself to God and become committed to following him, I want for myself what he wants for me. And my desires become what he desires for me. And in that sense, he gives us the desires of our heart because of he, we begin to long for ourselves what he longs for us. It's easy to live for the things of the world. One last verse I want to close with is in Philippians chapter 4. Almost there. Philippians chapter 4, verse 19. It says, And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Now to our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. He's the one that deserves all the glory. Why? Because he's going to take care of us our entire life when we submit to him. I think if we're wise this morning, I want you to listen to this phrase. Live for the maker, not the mirage. Live for the maker, not the mirage. The mirage is fake. The mirage will not bring satisfaction. It will not bring relief. It's not real. But if we live for the maker, he'll take care of us. Let's make that our goal this week and from this day forward. Live for the maker, not the mirage. And God will take care of us. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the opportunity to, to once again look at your word, to apply it to our hearts and our lives. And I pray, Lord, that you would do a work in our lives that only you can do. But Lord, we know that in order for you to work in our lives, we have to surrender. We have to commit ourselves to you, Lord. We have to daily be filled with the Spirit. Lord God, I pray that you'd help us to do that. It's so easy to live for what we think will bring us, bring us pleasure. Lord, it's so easy to look at what everyone else around us who's not living for you, what they have and what they get to do, and want it for ourselves. But Lord, I pray that you would help us to heed this instruction from Psalm 37. To not fret over evildoers, 
to not be envious of the workers of iniquity. To trust in the Lord, to do good, to dwell in the land, to feed on your faithfulness, to delight ourselves in you, Lord, knowing that you'll give us the desires of our heart. Lord, would you help us to do that? As heads are bowed and eyes are closed, just ask for a moment that no one be looking around and just an opportunity as we have each and every week to respond to the things that God shows us in his word. Say, Pastor, this morning, that's been one of my struggles. Looking at everyone around me and saying, man, I wish I had that. Looking at everyone around me and saying, man, they have it all together. and They, they get to do this and they get to go there and, and worrying about what they have. And they're not living for God. And I am. And look what I got to deal with. Say, Pastor, that's a struggle that I'm facing. Would you pray for me? You know, like that. Yeah. Yes. Seems like other people get it all. They have it all. They have it all together. But the reality is we often don't know. And Psalm 90, verses 5 and 6 reminds us, as fast as it can be gotten, it can be taken away. So, as Paul reminds us, having food and raiment, let us be content. You say, Pastor, this morning I struggle with that. Can I just challenge those of you who have lifted your hand, your heart towards the Lord this morning, to just take a moment and pray. You say, God, I need your help. God, I need to align my focus with yours need to have you establish my steps. I need you to clarify my focus, Lord. Just take a moment and say, God, I need you to, to live for you, to respond for you, to, to not be worried about everything else that's going around me, just to keep my own mind stayed on you. I need your help, Lord. And knowing that he will. Would you just take a moment and pray and just give it to the Lord. Maybe this morning you say, that statement was for me. Live for the maker, not the mirage. Live for what's real, not what's not. Let's all stand to our feet this morning. Lord Jesus, you know the very things that we struggle with. You know the very things that distract us. Lord, you know the very things that dishearten us. And I pray, God, that you'd help us all to, to be so focused on you, Lord. Lord, might we not be distracted by the things of this world, Lord. You remind us in 1 John 2, verses 15 through 17. For all that is in this world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And you remind us in verse 17 that the things of this world will pass away. Lord, would you help us to stay focused on what is most important? May our faith and trust in you be strong. May our desire to do good, to do the works of him that called us, be real in our life. And we'll praise you for that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.